Well, I told you last week, and I've told you before, on the Mount Rushmore of my preachers, favorite preachers, Paula Stone Williams is in the top five. And uh, I told her, I said, just feel at home here. You want to work on new material, do whatever you want to do. And she is going to speak, and I'm so honored. Would you give a warm round of applause to our guest speaker today, Paula Stone Williams. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about the shepherds and the magi and what they have in common. And it's not what you think. But before we can talk about them directly, some background understanding is necessary. Did you realize that we as a species work from only three different moral standards? Whoever you are, wherever you are on earth, whatever time you have lived, you work from one of three moral standards. The first and oldest moral standard of our species is that there is no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. This is the oldest moral standard of the species. It's still the moral standard in developing nations in Africa, some places South America, some places Central America. No greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. The second moral standard, second oldest, is that there is no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods. And this is the moral standard of all forms of fundamentalism, wherever you find it. Fundamentalist Buddhism, fundamentalist Hinduism, but especially fundamentalism from the three desert religions. There are three desert religions that are the largest in our world, All three began in the desert, so they began as religions of scarcity. Not a lot of resources in the desert, so I got to take care of me and mine. So all of them were religions where you're either in or out, and everything was focused on those who were in. Now you can contrast the three desert religions with, let's say, Native American religions or Pacific Islander religions. They don't have much in common because Native American and Pacific Islander religions came from places of abundance. So they are religions of abundance. But the desert religions began as religions of scarcity, and here's the bad news. In their fundamentalist forms, they remain religions of scarcity. Got to take care of our own. Everybody else is bad. So in Israel, that's the most conservative of the people of Israel, the most conservative Jewish people. And yes, they are the hawks who are the most involved and unfortunately the most dangerous when it comes to the Palestinians and Hamas. We see them in a small part of the world, in Israel, maybe in New York, among the Hasidim. This is how it expresses itself in fundamentalist Judaism. Fundamentalist Islam is in the Middle East, and you see huge fights within fundamentalist Islam between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Those stories are legendary for centuries. And here in the United States, it's primarily fundamentalist Christianity. Evangelical Christianity works from the moral standard that there is no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods as we interpret them. And that those interpretations should be forced on all people, not just those who hold to that particular religion. So these are the first two moral standards. And Philosopher anthropologist by the name of Rene Girard kind of got interested in seeing what happened among those people who held those standards. And he discovered in both of those moral standards, people freely gave their freedom away to the leaders of the tribe or to the leaders of the religion. And so Girard, who died just a couple of years ago, became obsessed with studying What were the leaders of those tribes and the leaders of those religions all about? And he discovered that, no surprise here, that those people, once they were in positions of power, did not want to give up that power. They wanted to retain the power that they had, and they decided the best way to do that, took eons to figure this out, but they decided the best way to do that was to create enemies within the camp. Oh, they're right here, right here among us. Terrible, awful people, and I am the only one who can identify them. So yes, you could move on to a different leader, but then that new leader will not be able to identify all the terrible, awful people who are in our midst. I am the only one who can identify them. 
I am the only one who can move them along and keep you safe. So this is what developed over the eons, whether in the realm of religion or in the realm of tribes. Those in power figured out the best way to stay in power was to create scapegoats. So one of the worst examples of it in tribal life would be the Third Reich and Hitler making scapegoats of the Jewish people, exterminating them. I'm the only one who can identify who the problem is. It's the Jews, and they must be exterminated. And in the United States, how is it expressed among the religious? Ah, their current enemy of choice is transgender people. 2019, 25 anti-transgender laws were introduced in state legislatures. This year, it's 590. And 90 of them have been signed into law. Now, notice one thing about both of these groups, and this is always the case of scapegoats who were chosen, is it is always a powerless group. In Germany, it's the Jewish people. Here, right now, among fundamentalists and evangelicals, it's transgender people who are, in fact, 0.58% of the population. So they choose groups that are utterly powerless, not able to protect themselves, and identify them as enemies. This is how people remain in power. Kind of fascinating to the work. He, he wrote about it in his book called Violence and the Sacred, and he called it all mimetic theory. So he said this is true whether you're talking about fundamentalist Christians in America or whether you're talking about the Third Reich. It's true of all power metanarratives. What is a power metanarrative? First of all, what's a metanarrative? A metanarrative is a big giant story that explains the meaning of life. Paula Stone Williams lives in Boulder, Colorado. That's a narrative. Paula Stone Williams lives in Boulder, Colorado and is here to save you from hell. That is a metanarrative. A big giant story that sets someone up as the leader who solves all the problems. So he studies all of these different cultures, all of these different religions, and he finds in all of these meta narratives, they're all power meta narratives. They are all the story written by the victor, the story written by the oppressor, the story written by those who are more powerful. He said, except one meta narrative in the history of our species, only one just one is not a power meta-narrative. He said, what's really weird is this is a meta-narrative that was born out of not the oppressor, but the oppressed. Born out of not the victor, but the victim. Born out not of those who law won, but of those who lost. It's a meta-narrative that says the least shall be the greatest, and the greatest will be the servants of all. It is, in fact, he discovered the Jesus meta-narrative. Now, this was not enough to cause him to become a Christian because he said, not the religion that developed out of the Jesus meta-narrative. That's just one more power meta-narrative. But if we could get back to the teachings of that one victim, of that one oppressed man, of that one person who said, it's being servants of awe, that meta-narrative, he says, could give hope to the species the Jesus meta-narrative. And the difference of that meta-narrative is shot through from the very beginning of the life of Jesus. Who are the first group that arrives after the birth of Jesus? It's the shepherds. There was no one in Hebrew culture who had less power than a shepherd. They were the lowest of the low, the poorest of the poor, they were the ones with no real hope of anything ever getting better. And they are the ones invited to the birth of Jesus. A major shift from any other kinds of meta narratives, right away saying it is in fact the oppressed. It is in fact the victim. It is in fact the loser who we invite to the table of hope, to the work that will develop out of this infant that lies in this manger. But then there's a second group that also is invited early in the life of Jesus. It's the Magi. Now, wait a minute. The Magi, people call them kings. They weren't kings, but they were men of great power from Persia, Zoroastrians and Zoroastrian leaders. And you say, well, they had a lot of power, 
Well, actually, they did, but it was a particular kind of power. They were astrologers, and in their culture, astrology was greatly respected. But astrology then wasn't what astrology is now. Astrology then was focused on the power of the individual. Now, remember, two moral standards. One, there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. Second moral standard, there's no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods. In both of these moral standards, you give up your personal freedom and hand it over to someone else, to religious leaders, to the priests in the Catholic Church. Hand it over to those, take away your own freedom. But these teachers taught that every individual is free to choose for themselves. Their teaching was radically different from any other teaching then in existence because it was a teaching focused on the individual, the freedom of the individual, the integrity of the individual, and the possibilities of the individual. So why were they invited there early on? Because that is the message Jesus would bring. Think about all the great teachings of Jesus. They are all focused on us as individuals working together to create a greater world. But they're focused on us as individuals. So like, just take a look at the very beginning of a Sermon on the Mount and take a look at the, at the Beatitudes. And we'll just take a look at three of them just to kind of give us an example of this. So the first Beatitude is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. But that term poor in spirit is actually a single word that is poorly translated here. It's a word that in common usage was always translated by the single word confused. So yes, how this actually should be translated is, blessed are the confused, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. I reckon that means I'm going to inherit the kingdom of heaven because I spend most of my life confused. There was a second understanding to that particular Greek word, and it was not confused, but it was curious. I like that too. Blessed are the curious, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about blessed are those who have the answers. He's talking about blessed are those who know what the questions are and are willing to ask the right questions. Blessed are those people. Then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's another specific word. Those who mourn the specific nature of their own sin. He's basically saying, blessed are those who are very self-aware, who are able to look in the mirror and don't always like what they see. For they will be comforted. You know, all of us have what I call abiding shadows. You know that problem that you had that got you in trouble when you were 18 and then also got you in trouble when you were 38 and also got you in trouble when you were 58? It's also going to get you in trouble when you're 88. We all have these abiding shadows that are, in fact, the problem in our lives that we just can't get a hold of. No matter how hard we try, we still find these abiding shadows surfacing and bringing grief into our lives, and it's very frustrating. We all have them. You might well know what yours is. I know what mine is. It's usually the opposite side of one of your strengths the shadow side of one of your strengths. So one of my abiding shadows is I have a tendency to open my mouth when it really should stay shut. So I actually have a plaque on my dresser that says, it's all right to have an unexpressed thought. I have a difficult time pausing, waiting, and virtually always throughout my life, if I'm going to get myself in trouble, it's by saying something that would be better left unsaid. So our abiding shadows, these things, we're not really ever going to get rid of them. The best you can hope for is identify them and lock them in the basement. And then just watch carefully to see if the basement lock has been broken. Because it'll break and they'll get out. And then the only thing we can do is go get them, bring them back, lock them in the basement again and hope they haven't done much damage while they were out. This is the best we can hope for with our abiding shadows. 
Jesus is saying here, blessed are those who mourn that, for they will be comforted. Then he says, blessed are the meek, who are the meek. Krista Vink, in his wonderful book, Precious Memories for a Faithless Time, says there are four different classes of people in the world. I want you to listen carefully and figure out which class you belong in. Four different classes of people. First are those who know that they know. Presidents, generals, admirals, award-winning cooks, football coaches, they've got the knowledge. They know they've got the knowledge. They want you to know they've got the knowledge. Those who know that they know you're thinking of somebody right now. I see it in your eyes. Those who know that they know might be one of those people. That's a first group. There's a second group. Believe it or not, even more difficult to get along with those who think that they know. They're convinced they've got all the answers when the truth is they do not even know what the questions are yet. This group includes most high school, all college students in America. Those who think that they know, just give them time, they'll figure it out. There's a third group. The third group I'm pretty comfortable with. The third group are those who know that they don't know. Humble folks who've lived long enough to realize, eh, I don't have nearly all the answers I once thought I had. And you become humble, quiet, with it all. Those who know that they don't know. But de Vink says there's a fourth group, and he says invariably the fourth group grows out of the third group. But they are people who put themselves on a spiritual journey that they will not stop short no matter what. They're going to grow no matter what. They will always ask the questions. They will always work hard to improve their lives and this last group he calls those who don't know that they know. Those who don't know that they know. Jesus called them the meek and said he, they will inherit the earth. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any of these people are likely to be elected as president of the United States or likely to be dictators anywhere on the planet. These who don't know that they know. You know, let me ask you a question. What happens on Father's Day? Father's Day, you, you, you buy your dad a tie or and you take him to the ballgame. We're not even sure when it is. We know it's in June. We think it might be the third Sunday. We're not sure. Every year we're asking ourselves, is it this week? I'm not sure. It's just no big deal. What happens on Mother's Day? The entire world comes to a halt. I lived in New York for 35 years. It is the busiest traffic day of the year in the metropolitan New York City area, bigger than Thanksgiving, Christmas, or Easter, because everybody knows where the real power lies. It lies with the mothers. It lies with those who don't know that they know. Jesus called them the meek and said they will inherit the earth. So all of Jesus' teaching focuses on the individual, and the individual becoming the kind of person who can reflect the life of Jesus. And now we come to our third moral standard of the species. The first moral standard, there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. The second moral standard, there's no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods. Both of these moral standards ask you to give up your personal freedom. The third moral standard, there is no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. It is the youngest and the smallest of the world's standards, and it grew out of the teachings of Jesus. So where is this the primary moral standard of a culture? Every place Christianity is gone. It's the primary moral standard of Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe. It's the major moral standard of North America, the major moral standard of New Zealand, of Australia. Every place Christianity has triumphed, that has become the moral standard. That is the lasting legacy of Christianity, even as people have abandoned the church. That there is no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. And it is shot through the Constitution of the United States of America. Did you ever notice that a lot of evangelical fundamentalist churches get really excited on the July 4th. And they have these amazing July 4th celebrations. I was a part of a, 
of a church once that asked me to speak on July 4th because they knew I could speak exactly the number of minutes that was necessary, seconds that was necessary. I had exactly three minutes and 15 seconds because when I finished, a squadron of jets was going to fly over on July 4th. And that was set no matter what. So I, they asked me because they knew I could, you know, pay attention to a clock. And I mean, everybody thought it was wonderful. And I'm up there thinking, this really is kind of neat. I love being an American, but it has nothing to do with the church. America's not God's chosen nation. God doesn't have a chosen nation. We missed the mark. But America exists because of the third meta narrative. It exists because of the person of Jesus. It's shut through our Constitution. It is shut through the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If there is a time America should be celebrating, it's Christmas. Because the foundation of our nation goes back to those shepherds and their powerlessness, who God proclaimed to be equal to all. It goes back to those magi, the Zoroastrian leaders, who were teaching something brand new in their world, that the individual should have the power to decide to be free to make their own decisions. And they became the teachings of the Messiah. God loves us just as we are and has created us with the ability to decide who we will be and what we will become. And that, that is why we celebrate at Christmas and why our nation should be celebrating the birth of Christ, because that's the meta narrative that gives us our hope as a people. Will you pray with me? God, thank you. Ah, uh, thank you for sending Jesus. So we got this whole nation and really this whole civilization, the Western civilization that God has given up on the church, really given up on Jesus, but we, we know, God, we know that what gave birth to democracy was this belief that there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the individual, which is what you sent your son here to earth to tell us. And when we protect that democracy, we are protecting that message. Let us celebrate the shepherds and the Magi, and the hope that came on Christmas morning. Amen. There are three ways you can give to support the love-focused, culture-changing, ever-evolving, community-building, Jesus-inspired work of the Village Church. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979, and you can give online at thevillageatlanta.com. Or you can send a check to The Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Have a great week!